this is a time of thanksgiving and joy. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice not in the circumstances, but in the Lord. Turn with me to Psalms, put Psalms 139. We're going to start there. This is my Thanksgiving sermon. We're going to talk about exactly where we are. God's plan. And God does have a plan. He's got a plan for me. He's got a plan for you. And he's got a plan for this nation. And that's why we can rejoice. That's why we're thankful. And that's why we have thanksgiving. God has this wonderful, marvelous plan for us. He is in charge. Now, I'm sure you remember the pilgrims, right? That's why we have thanksgiving. We've almost lost thanksgiving because we go straight into Christmas. But we do have a thanksgiving that we're thankful for. God has this plan. He's given us this wonderful nation. And this nation was built on freedom to worship as we choose. Psalms 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Notice there's a path and there's ways. For there's not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Before you ever have a word, before you ever speak it, God knows it. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. That's a good driving verse in Amarillo. Lord, go before me, go after me, and put your hand on top of me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high and I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me. Whoa, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Now that wasn't in the King James. But in verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall fall upon me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. You form me, you form my inward parts. You cover me in my mother's womb, and I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. That my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Talking about his mother. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Listen to this, verse 16. And in your book, there all were written the days fashioned for me. When as yet, there were none of them. God has this plan for our life. God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for your life. And God has a plan for this nation. Before there were ever any days, God knew it and had a plan for it. How precious also are your thoughts towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. God has this plan. Point number one. God has a plan. God has a plan for you individually. And God has a plan for this nation. In 1620, August 15, 1620. There was a band of men and women that we call the pilgrims. They called them separatists. They didn't like what was going on in England. They didn't like what was going on in the church. And here's why. The king had his right-hand man, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who wrote all the Sunday school lessons and wrote all the messages. And every preacher across England preached the same message that day that he didn't write, that he didn't study. The Archbishop of Canterbury told them exactly what to preach and what to say. And they wanted to study the Bible on their own and they wanted to work. They didn't even get to pick their songs. What you just sang this morning and what you heard would not have been possible in those churches. We want to worship as we choose and we want to worship the God we choose how we choose. And so we, we as separatists, decided we weren't going to put up with that anymore. We were going to come to a land that was free, that had freedom of religion. And so we got on a boat. We, we got on a boat. 
That was our moms and our dads and our uncles and our grandmas and our grandpas. They got on a boat called the Mayflower. Now, they got on two boats, the Mayflower and the Speedwell, and took off in the Speedwell. They owned the Speedwell, and they rented the Mayflower. The rental car lasted longer than the junk they bought. The Speedwell wouldn't make the trip, so they had to turn around twice, three times, and come back because it was leaking. It wasn't going to make the trip. That means that everybody couldn't go. So who all could go, got on the Mayflower, and off they went again. But by this time, man, it's September the 15th. And they're going to go across the ocean over to the New World. And it takes 30 days to do that. But they got caught in a storm because it was getting fall. And instead of 30 days, it took 62 days. Oh, brother. You talk about storm. A little bitty old boat. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, but I set off several years ago. We set this auditorium off and built the size of the Mayflower boat. See that lampstand right there? Right over there behind y'all, right, right there of that lampstand? And that lampstand right there? That's as long as the Mayflower was. From the back of this auditorium where, where the Meltons are sitting right there, the back wall, you can look back. It's okay, you can turn your head and look back there. They're waving at you. To the front of this stage is how wide it was. It was that wide and it was that long. And the deck that the, the pilgrims were on was five feet tall. So for 62 days, if they walked anywhere on that ship under the deck, they had to bend down because the, the deck was five feet tall. Now, if you came across one of the beams, whack, it was six inches lower. But not to worry because they had 50 to 100 bathrooms, personal bathrooms on that second deck of the Mayflower for all the people. Not. Not. But the thing was divided off in rooms so every family got a private room. You'd run a rope across there and put your sheet across there and there was your private room. It was an amazing task for 62 days. Why would they do it? Because they wanted to be rich. Nope. This nation wasn't started on gold. It was started on God. They were supposed to end up in the Virginia colony. They got blown off course, way off course, and ended up in Massachusetts where it was snowing. By the way, where this week it snowed six feet. It was snowing. Point number one, God has this plan. God's got a plan for this country. Now listen carefully. God has a plan for this country. It started off with a bunch of pilgrims, and it's ended up with us, and God's still got a plan for this country, and God's still working a plan for this country. God's got a plan. We're not off plan. And all the stuff that's going on all around us, and all the elections, and oh, goodness, gloom, despair, and that, we just read it in the scripture, agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad elections, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. No. <laughs> it is Thanksgiving. God's got it in his hand. God's got it. And we're not off plan. Now, we're going to study today and look at what I think is going on in this nation, what's going on with Daniel and his nation, exactly the same thing. And God's got it. And it's time for rejoicing and joy. It's Thanksgiving. God's got this plan. And before there was ever a word uttered out of your mouth, God knew it. And before there was ever a day that you lived, God had it written in a book. Same thing for this nation. God's got this plan. Now, would you turn with me to the book of Daniel? With the chimes. Daniel chapter 9. What's point number one? God's got a plan. God's got it right there in his hand. He's in charge of it. From the very beginning, before the foundation of the world, God had a plan for this nation. 
Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Point number 2, circumstances around us lead us to the Bible. Point number 2, let me say it again so you can write it down. Or some of you have a photographic memory, you can memorize it. Both of you. Circumstances around us lead us to the Bible. What God is doing in this world around us Lead us straight to the scriptures to say, what is God doing? What is God thinking? How could this happen? What is God doing around us? And that leads us straight to the scriptures. If you're a believer, it should take you straight to the Bible because God's got his plan written in the Bible. Point number two. The circumstances around us The timing of the circumstances around us should lead us straight to the Scriptures. Now, this has happened before. This isn't unique to the United States of America. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, this is Cyrus the Great. Darius is his Median name. Cyrus is his Persian name. In the first year, you would know him as Cyrus the great. In the first year of Cyrus, Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who is made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Okay, so what? Well, let me tell you what that verse says. Let me put it in perspective for you. Babylon, 70 years ago, has captured Israel and captured Jerusalem and carried them into captivity and brought them to the land and the country of Babylon. Now, what was that guy's name? Oh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar. You'd know Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel went to work for Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel became the prime minister of Babylon. For 70 years, he was prime minister of Babylon. And then one day, one night, everything changed again. Again. Now, here's Israel over in Babylon. They've been living here now. And Daniel has been their protector and the prime minister of Babylon for all these years. And Daniel is Nebuchadnezzar's best friend. Nebuchadnezzar has died in office. Daniel has retired. He's tired of politics and public life. And he's retired. And he's been retired for several years. And then that night, the Persians came to Babylon and surrounded it. Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, who is a fool, is having a great party. And the Medes and the Persians are outside the wall of Babylon. And this fool and his army, his military, who are very nervous about the situation, are having this gigantic party inside. And all of a sudden, there's this handwriting on the wall. That night, many, many tinkle, you farson. Nobody can interpret it. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar's wife shows up and she says, everybody's just screaming and crying because this this armless hand is writing on the wall. And she said, what's all the trouble? He said, well, look, and nobody can read the writing. And she said, yeah, they can. There's this guy that used to work for your granddad. His name is Daniel. He's retired. Call for him. He'll read it for you, moron. Now, that's not in the King James either. So he calls for Daniel, who's been retired all these years, living in peace. They bring Daniel in there, and they say, look, 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 look. And he, no one can read it. Can you read it? He goes, yeah, many, many tickle you far. No, 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 no. What does it mean? Well, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, and this night you're going to die. Oh, so that's what it means. That night, the Persians breached the wall underneath, came up through there and took over Babylon, the city of Babylon and the nation of Babylon. The king, his kids killed him in bed that night. They assassinated him. You know who the one guy that's left that can surrender the country? What's his name? Daniel! 
He's made him the, the third ruler of the, the, actually the second ruler of the, the nation. And so he's dead and now here come the troops and they all faced Daniel and said, who's in charge? And I went, he is. Daniel went, oh, good grief. All right, we surrender. Now, the circumstances are not looking very good at the moment. For Daniel, for the Jews, for Babylon. Now, let's read this verse again. I just told you the meaning of it. In the first year of Cyrus the Great, the Persian, in his first year, he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Happened that night that I just described to you. Many, many teeth of you first in the handwriting on the wall. And Daniel had to surrender the nation. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel. Now what you're going to find out is that Cyrus the Great makes Daniel the prime minister of Persia. Of Babylon of Persia. Persia. All of Persia. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Point number two, circumstances drive us to the word of God. Circumstances lead us to the word of God. It led Daniel to the word of God. Daniel watched all this take place. Daniel's in retirement. He's old. He's finished. He thought. A lot of you are in retirement. You've given your time. You're finished. You're going to spend out your years in peace and poverty. You think. But God's got this plan for you, and it's not your plan, it's God's plan. Many of you are young, and you're not interested in what's going around you. You're going to live your own life, you think. But God's got this plan. And here's Daniel... In verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the Bible. The circumstances that just took place are unbelievable. Should have never happened. It should have never happened to Daniel. Babylon should have never surrendered. They had an unbelievable army, but they had a moron that was leading the army. The circumstances are unbelievable. And the king is assassinated that night. they they brought Daniel in to read. All he was going to do was interpret the words on that stupid wall. Many, many tinkle you farson. And it put Daniel back into public life and back into politics and back running the country one more time. And that was not his plan. God, what are you doing? And they say, okay, now you're going to be the second ruler of the nation right now. And they put this great big gold purple thing on his chest and say, you're the, you're the ruler and I'm going to give you all this money. He said, I don't want your stupid money. I'm already rich. Keep all your gifts. I don't want them. They assassinate him that night and guess who becomes king of Babylon? King of Babylon! Daniel, that night, out of retirement. Boom! He wasn't looking for that. He didn't want it. I'm tired. He goes back to his room and he opens up the Bible and he starts reading Jeremiah. He starts digging in the scriptures. God, what are you doing? I don't want to be king of this stupid nation. I sure don't want to be going through this. I'm in retirement. What are you doing? It drives him. It leads him straight to the scriptures. And that's what ought to be happening to us today. What is going on in this nation, for heaven's sakes? The most powerful nation in the world politically, militarily, economically... You know how many aircraft carriers the United States has on this earth? Nineteen. You know how many aircraft carriers Russia has? One. You know how many aircraft carriers China has at this moment? One. Don't be fooled. Oh no, oh no, they're going to be mad at us. Oh no. They're going to send their aircraft carrier. You know what the uh, accuracy of one of our missiles is considered to be accurate is? Ten feet. You know what the accuracy of a Scud missile from Russia is? A quarter of a mile. Why do you think they missed the other day? What is God doing? Verse 
Two, as we watch what God is doing around us, it should lead us, direct us, drive us to the Scriptures. We ought to be digging around in the Bible saying, what is God doing? What is the timing of all this about? And we should be going, God's people, God's church should be going straight to the Scriptures. Folks, it's in there. This Bible is just like spaghetti sauce. It's in here somewhere. If we read it and we study it and we ask God to direct us, He will actually talk to us through this thing. It, this is a supernatural book that the Holy Spirit wrote. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of you interprets it for you as you read this that He wrote. He tells you what it means. And we can actually study this thing and God talks to us. And we can know what's going on. He has not left us here as orphans. He said that. Jesus said that. I am not, I am not leaving you as orphans. I will come to you. This Thanksgiving message is about a bunch of pilgrims that never in their, in their wildest dreams would think that this United States of America would come from them. Lord, what are you doing? What's your plan? What's your timing? And a bunch of separatists, 120 to be exact, come over here so they can have freedom of worship. And here we are today. They're kids. They're grandkids. They're great, 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 great grandkids. And here we are today. Point number two, circumstances lead us to the Bible. Point number three, as we read the Bible, it leads us to God's plan on what he's doing. The Bible leads us to God's plan. Look with me in 9-2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the Bible. So he's been reading more than one. The number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. And as he digs around through the scriptures and he's reading these different books to see what God's doing in the Bible, he comes across Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25 Starting in verse 11, it's on the screen. He reads this. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon how many years? Seventy years, he says it in verse 2. He would accomplish seventy years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face towards the Lord God. All right, point number three. The Bible leads us to God's plan. As we read in God's plan, as we study God's plan, as we read the Bible, we figure out that God has this plan that he's been working on from the very beginning since the creation of the world. God set up the United States of America's plan before he ever created this earth. He's got us. We're in his hand. The pilgrims, when they first came over, were the beginning of that plan. You are in the middle of this plan. God's got a plan. Now let me tell you what the Bible says about his plan. Jesus is coming back. We call it the rapture. He uses the word rapturia in the Latin Bible to talk, and we just pulled it straight out of Latin, rapture. Christ is coming back to take his church to heaven. One day, Jesus said, only the Father knows when it's going to be. We don't know. No one knows the, the day or the hour that's going to happen. But he said, you can look and see that it's getting close. The resurrection is almost here. Our resurrection, our changing is almost here. God's got this plan. And as we look at the plan, we're going to see what God is doing. It's not just... The United States of America, God's got a plan, not just for this country, but for His believers. It's called the, rec the resurrection, the rapture of His people. As God jerks His church out of here, and the word means to jerk out, literally, to grab hold of it and jerk it. I was going to show you an illustration of that from one of these guys on the front row, but they're all bigger than I am, and I just didn't want to chance it. But you just jerk it. 
Well, let's give him an illustration. Stick your hand out. Get ready. <laughs> Jerk it! <laughs> what did I just do? I jerked him up. That's rapture. That's what the Latin word means. Jerk him up. I'm not going to mess with you. Never mind. <laughs> Point number three. As we study the scriptures. It will lead us to God's plan. Now here's God's plan. Here's what Jesus said. Get ready. He said this literally. Get ready. No one knows the day or the hour. It'll be like a thief in the night. Get ready. That brings us to the last point. Point number four. God's plan leads us to prayer. God's plan should drive us to prayer. God's plan should lead us to prayer. Look at Daniel. I set my face, verse 3, I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer. Would you underline it? By prayer and supplications. Supplications mean we just keep on praying until it happens. It's work prayers. So the definition of supplications are work prayers. We just keep praying until it happens. With fasting, sackcloth, and ashes, he really wanted to know. And I prayed to the Lord, my God, should drive us to prayer. This is our hope. Our hope is not that circumstances go well. Our hope is that God answers our prayers. And here's what he's going to pray. Now, here we go. We're going, to say the, we're going to spend the next five minutes in this prayer, and then we're going to quit. This is a cool prayer. Listen to this prayer. Verse, verse 7. Well, verse start in verse 4. O oh Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and His mercy with those who love Him. Do you love Him? Then He keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him and, and with those who keep His commandments. Lord, we've sinned. We've committed iniquity. We've done wicked and rebelled even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. We haven't followed the Scriptures. We haven't kept the Ten Commandments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and all the people of the land. Lord, you've spoken to, over the years, you've spoken to our presidents. You've spoken to our governors. You've spoken to our congress. You've spoken to our judges. And Lord, over these last few years, we have not followed you and we have not listened to you. This is us. Verse 7. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near and far off. Verse 8, O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we've sinned against you. And then we're going to stop right there and be in total depression. And this will be Thanksgiving dinner. No! This has a happy ending to it. Watch verse, verse 12. Well, verse 11. Yes, all of Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse, the oath written in the law of Moses. This is Leviticus 26. Been poured out on us. Verse 12. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judge us by bringing up a great disaster upon us. But now watch this. Starting right here, I want you to underline this in verse 12. You're going to need to underline this because it's important. This is the happy ending. For under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done in Jerusalem. And you think, oh my goodness. That's terrible. Well, what's been done in Jerusalem? So does that, does that mean no nations have ever fallen? That means no nations have ever been carried into captivity? No, that means No. Go down with me to verse 15. What is it that's never been done under heaven? Verse 15, And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. Why were they in Egypt in the first place? God took them there. 
Now, they got away from God there, but God took them there. And they're in Egypt in the first place. He brought them out with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. We've sinned, we've sinned and done wickedly, but you have brought us out of Egypt. And here's what he's praying. Lord, that was back then. This is now. The 70 years are almost up. Lord, you did it back then. Do it again. Lord, you brought them out of Egypt. Bring us out of Babylon, just like you promised. Do it again. God has this plan. And as this world falls apart, and it literally is falling apart, it's always been falling apart. But as it falls apart on a worldwide scale, God's got this plan, and it's good news. Jesus is coming to jerk his church out of here. We should be praying exactly that. What's Daniel praying? What's Daniel praying? Verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 15. What's Daniel praying? Take us back. You promised you'd get us out of here? Get us out of here. It's been 70 years, Lord. Get us out of here. Do you see that? Lord, you're going to do something that the whole heaven hasn't seen before. You brought us out of Egypt. Now do it again and bring us out of Babylon. And he did. He did. And here's Daniel praying it. Do it. Daniel was not expecting to be left there. Daniel was not expecting to have to make this prayer. Daniel was not expecting to have to be prime minister again. Daniel was not expecting to be protecting God's people one more time in Persia. He just didn't. He got thrown into the lion's den after this. For heaven's sakes, can't you just retire in peace? Nope. God's calling you back up. It's almost time. Jesus is right on the verge of coming. Our prayer should be this. This is, this is Thanksgiving. This is the Thanksgiving message, and this is, this is real. This is reality at this time. God is about to take us out of here. He's about to deliver us one more time. What should we be praying? Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come quickly. And Lord, would you bring as many people to Christ as you can during this time before you come? Lord, save Texas. Lord, save the United States. God, bring our people here. Until you do that, I'm going to pray. And God, come quickly. Get us out of here. That's what we should be praying. Point number four, our hope, God's plan leads us to prayer. What should we be praying? Jesus, come on down. Get us out of here. And Lord, as you do, don't just take me. Take Israel. This is his prayer. Lord, don't just take me. I'm old. I'm tired. I've already won. I've been the prime minister of two different nations. Don't just take me. Take Israel. Take the church. That's what he's praying right here. God save the church. God save my nation. Jesus is almost here, folks. It's getting really, really close. What should we be praying? First off, Lord, come quickly. Come on. I'm joining with you in prayer. I'm agreeing with you. Come on. Quickly. Suddenly, by the way, is how Jesus says it. Suddenly. But the rest of his prayer is, Lord, this people has sinned. And we as a nation have sinned greatly against you. And we had all these blessings and privileges that we have sinned against you. But Lord, save them too. That's what we should be praying. That is our prayer. That is the message. And that is our Thanksgiving message. It has a happy ending. We're almost there. We're almost there. All we have to do is pray. And he tells us how to do it. Lord, come quickly. And Lord, bring the rest of the church with you. Bring our nation with you. Come on back. And Lord, bring them with you. I don't know what you're going to have to do. But save them. I'll tell you what he did. He took Babylon into captivity. And there was Israel. And by the way, Israel got saved. They went back home. 
You know what first command, one of the first commandments of Cyrus the Great was? Send Israel back to the promised land. And they're going, no! Send them back to the promised land. Let them rebuild the temple. And they're going, oh! Oh, go on, go on, get, church. Okay, we'll go back to Israel and rebuild the temple then. And they did. We're going to stop. It's time to quit. It's Thanksgiving. And it has a happy ending. Jesus Christ comes to get us. And one of these days when we know not, boom, we're out of here. Don't get left. Be sure you're ready to go. Have you asked Christ to forgive all your sins? Have you asked Christ to be your Savior? Have you turned your life over to Him? Don't leave today without doing that. I'm going to release this group in just a moment, this congregation. I'm going to let them go. But if you haven't done that, I'm going to be up here at the front. You come and talk to me about how to become a Christian. I'm not going to talk to you about how to be a Baptist. Being a Baptist will not get you into heaven. Being God's son or daughter will. I'll tell you what Jesus says in the Bible. So before, they, before you leave, as they're leaving, before you leave, come and talk to me about how to go to heaven. But right now we're going to stand.